Hello everyone and welcome to WASP 101. I'm Andrea Rossi, the developer of WASP. This tutorial will be the first of a series of four or five tutorials which are going to explore the uh, topic of constraints in WASP. What we're going to be exploring in this tutorial is how you can set specific constraints which can be either at the part level or at the uh, global aggregation level which will limit your aggregation in certain ways. In this first tutorial of this uh, group of tutorials, we are going to be exploring the support constraints. And what a support constraint is, is a constraint that allows you to specify custom positions on a part which need to be supported, meaning they need to be in contact with another part already placed in the aggregation, in order to allow the part to be placed. We are going to see how you can set the supports and well as, as well how you can modify them in order to suit your needs. Let's get started. If you download the Rhino and Grasshopper files that you will find in the description of this video, you will find already preset for you two parts. We have a linear part, which has four connections on the top and four on the bottom, as you can see here, and which are organized by type in order of as top and bottom. And you will find a second part, which is an L-shaped profile, which as well contains four connections, which are organized on top and bottom. What we want to do is we want to start building these parts but what we're going to do is instead of using what we used uh, in the previous tutorials which was a basic part we're going to be using an advanced part which will allow us to set more details about the part and particularly for the case of this tutorial we're going to use it to set supports let's go on and bring in an advanced part and you'll see that the first set of inputs is exactly the same as what you have in in the basic part and so we're going to start naming this part and I'm going to just name it stick for now. And then I'm going to assign my geometry, which I can find in this geometry component and my connections, which I can find in this merge. And now what we want to do is we want to assign to this part uh, some sort of supports. And what is a support? A support is a point, or as I said in the introduction, is a point on a part that needs to be uh, in contact with, um, with another part when it's placed in order to allow the part to be placed. So these parts, as we have top and bottom connections, will be simply stacked on top of each other, starting from a bottom one and growing up. And so you see that on the part I've been, setting, been drawing four vertical lines intersecting the bottom surface on the part and I'm going to use these four lines to define a support. So what's going to happen when we aggregate is that each of this line will be checked whether it's intersecting with another existing part and if that's the case the part will be allowed to be placed. Let's go on and under our first part create a curve component, right click set multiple curves and let's go and select these four red lines in order. Now, what you can do with supports is not only define that all these lines have to be supported, but also that custom combination of those lines needs to be supported in order for the part to be placed. So to build these combinations, let's go on and create a list item and zoom in and add three more inputs in order to have all four lines available in here. And then we are gonna go in our wasp elements and bring in a support. Now with a support what we can do is we can add any combination of those lines and in order for a part to be placed these, all these lines have to intersect at the same time. So what we can do is we can create multiple combination of those lines and this will allow us to set different custom support conditions that can be used during aggregation. The aggregation will then test all the support condition that we provide and will place the parts if at least one of these support condition is satisfied. So let's create our first support condition and the first support condition I'm going to set is that the first line and the last line need to be both supported at the same time. So I'm going to connect my first line and then with shift pressed connect the last line and then this is not necessary but you can also connect the geometry input from our part 
And this will also perform a check to make sure that your lines are in the right place and they're actually intersecting this part in order to make sure that you didn't draw them, for example, completely inside or outside. Great, this is our first support. We can then go and get a second one and create a second one. And in this case, I'm gonna create a support that says that first line and ter first point and third point have to be supported. So I'm gonna connect the first and with shift the third one. And I'm gonna skip on the geometry for now because I knew I drew them correctly. I'm gonna then create a third support. And this is gonna be that the second line and the last line will be supported. And so I'm gonna connect this and this. Now that we created our three supports, we can create a merge component, merge them all together. And then we can just go and take them and connect them to our support tab. We are gonna go on and do the same exact thing on our second part. So we are gonna first of all create an advanced part in this case, I'm gonna name it angle. I'm gonna connect again my geometry and I'm gonna connect my connections. And then I'm gonna come a bit lower and create a curve component. Right click, set multiple curves, select my four elements create a list item and again add input so that I have all the parts and so now I'm gonna create some constraints here too and then again my first constraint is gonna be first and last and then I'm gonna create a second one which is gonna be I'm gonna do the same so first and third and second and fourth so that this is somehow supported it's not gonna cantilever too much. So first and third. And then once again, I'm gonna get another support and connect second and fourth. Once again, merge. And connect this to our supports. Okay, we set up our two parts and now I'm gonna create a merge component where I'm gonna connect both parts. And now we can proceed and try to create an aggregation and see what happens. So we're gonna go on and get a stochastic aggregation. Once again, I'm using stochastic aggregation, I said it in all tutorials, simply because it's quicker and I can focus on the topic of the tutorial, but everything I'm, I'm showing you works exactly in the same way when using field aggregation. So you can apply the same constraints and everything to a field aggregation, I'm just not doing it in this tutorial simply because it would take more a bit too much time. So we're gonna, we have our two parts and we're gonna connect them in our part. I'm gonna specify my number, which is gonna be, for example, 120. For the rules, I'm gonna use a rule generator. And to specify the rules, I'm gonna use a rule grammar. And I'm gonna say that I'm gonna connect top to bottom. And I'm just doing top to bottom because I'm just doing top to bottom simply because I want to grow up because if we would be growing downwards, supports would not really make sense. So in this case, I'm just going to grow upwards. So from the top, I'm going to add a bottom on over it. And I'm going to connect these rules. And so now I'm going to start, just go and create a get part geometry to see what's happening. Now you see that what's happening is that we get this random stacking of elements and you will also notice that the supports that we were setting are not uh, actually applied. 
The reason for that is that in order to apply supports to uh, an aggregation, we have to change the aggregation mode. So you have four different aggregation modes. The default aggregation mode doesn't take into account any constraint. The aggregation mode one uses only local constraints, meaning constraints that you set at the part level, such as supports. Mode two will use just global constraints, which you will see in further uh, tutorials. And the mode three will use all the constraints, so both local and global. In this case, we just have support, so we just have local constraints. So if we want to have our local constraints to be applied, we should change the mode of the aggregation from zero to one. If now I create a button and I press to reset, you see what happens. So no matter how I reset, all I get is a vertical stack of elements. And the reason why that's happening only like this is because these parts are the only parts that can have their support uh, satisfied. Because those parts always have support that are not in the same line. And so they will never find a position to be placed. In order to make this a little bit more interesting than just a vertical stack of elements, what we can do is we can create a base for our aggregation in order to um, have a surface of parts which will form the starting point of our elements. How can we do that? We have seen that in a previous tutorial, which was the tutorial on transform parts, on how we can create parts uh, at the beginning of our aggregation, which will act as the starting point. So to do that, I'm going to move my aggregation here a little bit further away. And I'm going to start from creating a base, which is just going to made of stick parts, which will create a sort of a mat on top of which we can stack all the parts. So how we do that? If you remember from a previous tutorial, we can do that with transform parts. So what we are going to do is I'm going to connect my stick part to transform part. And then we have to specify how to transform it. So if we want to create a mat, we want to move this part in the x direction of a number of times with this dimension, and this part in, y di in the y direction for, again, a number of times. So I'm going to go on and measure this distance and know that it's 10 millimeters. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a series where my starting point is 0. The step size is going to be 10. And I'm going to, for example, create 15 of them. Oops, sorry, not 150, but 15 of them. What I'm going to do with this series of numbers now is I'm going to create an x, a unit x vector. And then I'm going to transform this part. Oops, sorry. We have to first create a transformation. And we're going to create that with a move component where we're going to connect our T. And then in the X output, we get a transformation which we can apply to our part. If you want to see what we created, you can just get a WASP part geometry. Take a look and you say that we created a little mat of parts. I could increase it or decrease it as you wish. Now we want to further move all these parts in this direction. And in this case, the length of this one is going to be 50. So I'm going to create a second series where the start point is going to be 0 again. The step is going to be 50. And this time I'm going to just create 8 of them, given that they're much larger. I'm going to get a second transform part component then, connect our part, and then once again for this series create a unit y in this case, vector, and then again a move component, and then connect the x output to transform. You can just use the same part geometry to check what we did. And you see that we did something wrong. So what we are doing is we are applying one transformation to one of each parts, and then we don't create all of them. If we want to make sure that we apply all the transformation to all of them, we just want to right click on the part input and graft it. And now you see that we are effectively creating a mat. 
We want to also make sure that now all these parts are back in one big group, so we want to right click on the part out and flatten the output. So I'm going to go back and maybe make a bit more in this direction and maybe a bit less in this direction. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take this part that we created and we're going to plug them in the prev input of our stochastic aggregation. If now I go on and I reset, you see what happens. Now this base acts as a, as a base for our aggregation and our parts now can be stacked correctly uh, fitting to our supports. What we can also do now is we can maybe split up the aggregation a little bit in order to um, visualize it a bit better. So I'm going to delete my part geometry for now. And what I'm going to do first of all is I want to split the list between the parts that I used as a base and the parts that have been added during aggregation. To do that, I'm going to use a split list component. And as the I index to split the list, I'm going to use the length of this list. So I'm going to create a list length component, connect it to my part out, drag it forward here, and then connect it to my input. So now in output A, I have all the parts they were already placed at the beginning and in output B I have the parts that have been added to the aggregation by the aggregation component itself. So I can get a WASP part geometry connected to the output A and then I actually get my base and then I can actually get a custom preview connected to visualize it and then I'm going to create a swatch which I'm going to make something like gray in order to show that those were kind of parts that have been created in advance. Now for the output B, what I can do is what we have been doing in many other tutorials is I can just split this output in the two different part types. I'm going to do that by going to wasp filter parts by name and I'm going to connect the input B to the first one and create a panel with the name stick in there. and then create a part, uh, go to wasp, get part geometry, and extract the geometry, and so you see that I got all the sticks. And then I'm going to copy paste my custom preview, and change the color. I'm going to then copy paste this whole block, a bit lower, change the name in the panel to angle and then change the color to something else. I can then go on and select everything I had created before and right click and hide it. And now I can see what I created and you can see that our parts are effectively placed in order to uh, always satisfy at least one of the constraints. So you see that you never have crazy cantilevering parts, but all the parts always have a support. Now, this is exclusively a local check. So be aware that if you start cantilevering multiple parts sequentially over each other, even if the cantilever at the local level would work, at some point the aggregation would end up collapsing. And the other thing that it's really important to be aware of is that as soon as we start constraining an aggregation very much, like in the case of like what we are doing now, the aggregation algorithm might not always be able to find solutions. This is the case if I start increasing the number of parts. And now it's always going to work because it's, it can always create a stacking between those vertical elements. But if I go to my rule generator and I force it to not allow a connection between parts of the same time, so if I say toggle, like I create, so I do that by creating a Boolean toggle and connecting it to selfie and leaving it on false. If now I bring this to zero and I reset my aggregation, if I start growing, you see that my aggregation will actually grow in layers. And you will see that after a certain time, 
Oh, we're actually lucky, but you see that at some point it's gonna fail because it's unable to find a location where it could actually place another part uh, without uh, breaking the constraints that we did. So now this is uh, slightly buggy, I noticed, so there might be a chance that there might still be some solutions in here that uh, the algorithm cannot find. But in general, you have to be aware that as soon as you start using constraints, your aggregation will start being limited. And so there's going to be points in which this aggregation will not be able to grow uh, any further. So you see how by just adding a little bit of uh, intelligence in our part, we can start uh, adding constraints which bring our aggregation much closer to the real world so that we can start understanding what are the constraints of an aggregation when we're trying to build something that would relate to architecture. And so we can start embedding those limitations and those constraints directly in our part and then have our aggregation algorithm take care for us that these constraints are satisfied. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, first tutorial in constraints. Uh, the next tutorial will be looking at how we can add ac extra colliders that can be checked in different points in the aggregations. And these colliders could be used, for example, to uh, represent uh, the geometry of a, gr a robotic gripper, which has to assemble these parts. And then further on, we are going to go and explore uh, global constraints, which are going to be planes and meshes, which we can use to limit the aggregation to specific shapes. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you liked it and want to stay updated with the tutorial coming, please subscribe to the channel. And for now, thanks for watching and see you in the next tutorial.